The Emperor Caligula is one of history's most puzzling and controversial figures. His brief and bloody reign was marked by such extravagance, cruelty, bizarre behaviour and general immorality that it has led to posterity condemning him as a madman. He called himself a god, had temples built in his name and terrorised half the world with his callous disregard for human life. Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Austin, and today we're delving into the mind of ancient Rome's most notorious emperor, Caligula. To ask if all of the stories about him are true, did he really sleep with his sisters? Did he appoint his horse to the Senate? Was he really as unhinged as everybody said? Or is it all exaggeration? Let's look at the evidence. Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, to give him his full name, was the third Roman emperor, ruling for less than four years from 37 to 41 AD, between his uncles Tiberius and Claudius. Born into the entitled and murderously competitive ruling dynasty of the Roman Empire, Caligula spent his entire life luxuriating in the pleasures and privileges of power. But under the ever-present threat of it being violently taken away at any moment. To understand Caligula the man, we must first begin with his early years, which were overshadowed by scheming, betrayals, bloody purges and poisonings. And that was just within his own family. He was born in the year 12, in the final years of the reign of Augustus. His father was Germanicus, a handsome and popular Roman general, and the adopted son of the emperor-in-waiting, Tiberius. His mother was Agrippina, a granddaughter of Augustus, a glorious pedigree. But as a third-born son and a rather sickly child, less was expected of him than of his brothers. Having spent his first two years in Rome, he was then sent to join his father on campaign in Germania. He was accompanied by a doctor on his journey north because he was troubled with the falling sickness, morbus committialis in Latin, or what we now know as epilepsy. Suetonius tells us, he had some endurance, yet at times because of sudden faintness, he was hardly able to walk, stand up, collect his thoughts or hold up his head. His father was in command of eight legions, a third of the entire Roman army. And when his son arrived at one of the military camps, a miniature soldier's uniform was made for him, right down to the armour and caligae, the tough hobnail boots worn by the ordinary legionaries. And the troops nicknamed him Caligula, literally Little Boots, a name which stuck but which he hated in adult life. At the time, there was widespread unrest in the legions who were unenthusiastic about Tiberius taking over the imperial throne. It could easily have escalated into civil war, but Germanicus managed to put down the mutiny with a combination of harsh discipline and the charm of his little boy and his tiny boots. The new emperor Tiberius was very different in personality to Augustus. He lacked charisma and when speaking often left people uncertain about what he meant. He hated the scheming and politicking of court life, and although he started pretty well, he soon turned into a tyrant, hiding himself away from the public to pursue perverse and sadistic pleasures and becoming increasingly suspicious of the world and everyone in it. This included his nephew Germanicus, Caligula's father, despite having adopted him as his son a few years earlier. After his successes in Germania and retrieval of two of the three standards lost in the disastrous Battle of the Teutoburg Forest six years earlier, Germanicus was awarded a triumph in Rome and acclaimed as a hero. But Tiberius then sent him out to the Eastern Empire to reorganise the provinces which had been neglected in Augustus's latter years. Whether this was a natural promotion or the sidelining of a potential rival by an insecure despot we don't know. But in Syria, Germanicus suddenly fell ill. Dark spots appeared all over his body and froth flowed from his mouth. When the inevitable occurred, 
there was an outpouring of grief among the common people as his ashes were brought back to Rome. And everybody believed he had been murdered on Tiberius's orders. His son Caligula, now aged seven, lived with his mother and siblings, all of whom were kept close to the imperial court so their every move could be watched. In the year 26, after years of wrangling with the Senate, Tiberius abandoned Rome and retreated to a magnificent clifftop palace, the Villa Jovis, on the island of Capri, leaving the day-to-day -day administration of the empire to Sejanus, commander of the Praetorian Guard, a dangerous man who had ambitions for himself. Whether through Tiberius's own paranoia or at the instigation of Sejanus, Caligula's family came under suspicion and his mother Agrippina was placed under house arrest for what really amounted to bad attitude. And the teenage Caligula and his sisters were sent to live with their great-grandmother, the arch-schemer Livia. When she died, they were sent to live with their grandmother Antonia. But in reality, they were little more than prisoners, and everything they said or did was reported to Sejanus. In the year 31, when Caligula was 18, his mother was exiled to the island of Pandateria, just 50 miles from Tiberius's palace on Capri, but a million miles from its luxuries. She was beaten so badly she lost an eye, and was either poisoned or deliberately starved to death. His brother Nero, accused of sexual misdemeanours, was exiled to a different island, where he was executed as well and his other brother Drusus was thrown into a dungeon in Rome for supposedly plotting against Tiberius, and he too was slowly starved to death. At the same time, Caligula was summoned to live with his great-uncle Tiberius in his palace on Capri, and for six long years he lived there and was somehow able to avoid the fickle tempers of the now twisted and sadistic Tiberius. Caligula is said to have shown no emotion when news of his mother's and brother's deaths reached the court. This is sometimes used as evidence that he was callous and so self-obsessed he didn't care about anybody else. But I think it shows the opposite, an acute awareness of how precarious his position was. If he had dared to show any grief, he would not have lasted long in the pit of vipers that was Tiberius's palace. In terms of decor, the Villa Jovis wasn't a bad place to live. Upstairs, everything dripped with gold and precious stones, and its marbled halls were filled with treasures from across the empire. The finest artists and craftsmen were brought in to produce lavish mosaics, paintings and sculptures. Tiberius had a reputation for being a bit miserly, but he spared no expense in ensuring his palace was as grand and ostentatious as it could possibly be. And although he is usually said to have secluded himself on Capri, he was certainly no solitary hermit. His court was supported by an enormous retinue of slaves, servants, musicians, cooks, astrologers, philosophers and scantily clad entertainers. Every conceivable human desire was catered for, as long as he remained upstairs. Because downstairs there were dungeons and torture chambers and rooms filled with the instruments of death. And Caligula would have known that one false move could have resulted in him being plucked from the opulence of the gilded dining halls above and consigned to the Stygian gloom below, from which no one emerged alive. You can still see the ruins of the villa complex today not a lot remains of its former grandeur, but amazingly you can still stand on the 2,000 year old balcony from which unfortunates were thrown to be dashed on the rocks below. Tiberius would invite senators and wealthy citizens to come and stay, but only to humiliate them by insisting on them performing degrading acts in front of him, and he had a library of instruction manuals and erotic mosaics for them to consult if they needed an illustration of what he demanded. In the woods around the villa where he took his walks, he had young people dressed up as fauns and nymphs under orders to busy themselves in the nooks and grottos. And if Suetonius is to be believed, he kept a harem of minnows to swim around him in his pool and nibble his inflamed skin. But they were not fish. 
When Tiberius was bored of indulging in the pleasures of Venus, he would move on to pain. One amusing after-dinner game was to ply his male guests with wine, then have a ligature tied around their nether regions to prevent them from being able to relieve themselves. If anyone he gave his attention to complained, he would have their legs broken. Or worse. Guests were sometimes so traumatised by his demands they could not live with their shame and took their own lives. All of this went on under the watchful eye of the young Caligula. For six years he sat by, smiling nervously, never knowing if he might be the next for the drop, just trying to stay alive. This period is portrayed frighteningly well in the 1979 movie Caligula, in which we see the young prince being ordered to dance and act the buffoon to entertain the bored and dangerously unstable Tiberius. Unfortunately, this is about all I can show as the description of the movie by one of its stars, Helen Mirren, as an irresistible mix of art and genitals is very apt. Although, I have to say, I didn't see a lot of art. While other potential rivals were systematically eliminated, somehow Caligula survived. Tiberius even chose a wife for him when he was 21, Junia Claudilla, the daughter of an important senator, but not from the imperial family, suggesting the wily old emperor was nervous about conferring too much status onto Caligula. Sadly, we know very little about her, other than that she died in labour and the child shortly afterwards. I think this shows how difficult it is to make judgments about Caligula's personality and state of mind. This would be a major life event for anyone, and how he reacted to it would say a lot about him as a man but we know nothing about its impact on him, or even in what year it occurred. Caligula needed allies, and wisely spent time befriending the new Praetorian prefect, Macro, who took over when Sejanus fell out of favour. Macro spoke well of Caligula to Tiberius, and attempted to quell any ill will or suspicions the emperor might have felt. Caligula also befriended Macro's wife, Ennia, and, possibly at the instigation of Macro himself, began a passionate four-year relationship with her, alongside his other relationships with his sisters. In the year 35, Caligula was named joint heir to Tiberius, along with his nephew and Tiberius's grandson, Gemellus. They were both in favour, for now. Two years later, Tiberius died. Some ancient sources say he died a natural death, but both Suetonius and Tacitus repeat rumours that Caligula either had him murdered or carried out the deed himself by smothering him with a pillow. On the very day of Tiberius' passing, Caligula was proclaimed the new emperor by members of the Praetorian Guard at the port of Mycenae, across the Bay of Naples, and this was soon ratified by the Senate. Tiberius's will, naming two heirs, was annulled, on the grounds that he had been insane, and the 15-year-old Gemellus frozen out. So, now he was emperor, and had no one to answer to but himself, you might think that Caligula immediately launched into the debauchery and bizarre behaviour for which he is famous. But no, for the first seven months of his reign, he was a model of good leadership making efforts to ensure his popularity with the public by hosting lavish games, with the army by ensuring that they were paid handsome bonuses, and with the aristocracy and senate by staging a public burning of Tiberius's secret papers, signifying an end to his hated treason trials. And Caligula continued to listen to Macro and other advisers about how to behave at public functions and when receiving foreign dignitaries, and how not to alienate the senate. And by all accounts, his assumption of power was welcomed across the empire, which had grown tired of Tiberius's tyrannical rule. He was keen to portray himself as restoring the rule of law, and reduced a huge backlog of court cases by abolishing the need for decisions to be confirmed by the emperor. He recalled many of those Tiberius had sent into exile, lifted censorship, got rid of some taxes, and published accounts of public expenditure. He embarked on a series of major infrastructure projects to improve the water supply to Rome, and the harbours at Regium and Syracuse to ensure easier grain imports from Egypt to reduce the risk of food shortages. 
he completed the Temple of Augustus, enlarged the Imperial Palace, and began new aqueducts. He had a new chariot racing track built on his mother's estate on the west bank of the Tiber, erecting an Egyptian obelisk as a marker, and he even joined in some of the charioteers practicing, which would have been regarded as very undignified by the upper classes. His circus is now underneath St Peter's, but the obelisk he brought over still stands proudly in the square in front of the basilica. His gladiatorial games were legendary. Whatever we may think about slaughtering 160,000 animals for entertainment in just three months, the Roman public loved it, especially as during Tiberius's reign games had been severely restricted. Everything seemed to be going well. And then, in October 37, he became seriously ill. We know very little about his illness, other than that it went on for several months, and there were genuine fears that he might not live. But there is very little information about what symptoms he had. This hasn't stopped people speculating about what his illness might have been, however. Numerous theories have been proposed, including a prolonged epileptic seizure, encephalitis due to infection or inflammation of the brain, and specifically encephalitis lethargica, a strange illness that we still don't know the cause of, which occurs in epidemics and leaves people sleeping for months or years on end. Other suggestions for which there is even less evidence are thyrotoxicosis, or raised thyroid hormone levels, neurosyphilis, lead poisoning, or a severe depressive episode. The truth is we simply don't know what was wrong with him. One of the few contemporary accounts of his life is by Philo of Alexandria. He actually met Caligula and tells of a great sadness that affected the empire during his illness, and that this was a more terrible disease than that which was oppressing Caligula, for his sickness was of the body alone. But Philo is also clear in saying that Caligula was different after his illness, and that he developed a ferocity of disposition. This suggests he could have had a personality change as a result of brain damage of some kind. But Philo continues by positing that rather than his savageness being a completely new personality trait, it may have been there before his illness, but simply overshadowed by pretense and hypocrisy. And this is the view taken by later Roman historians, who suggest that Caligula was always bad but he didn't really get into top gear with his misdeeds until after his illness. Whatever the cause, his behaviour was certainly different. The first victims of his new appetite for blood were his nephew Gemellus, who, now on the verge of manhood, posed a potential threat, and Macro, who after years of loyal service was ordered to fall on his sword, and his son and wife, who had previously shared Caligula's bed were also culled. As well as permanently ridding himself of possible rivals, he set about belittling and humiliating senators and wealthy citizens. Suetonius wrote, There was hardly any lady of distinction with whom he did not make free. He used commonly to invite them with their husbands to supper, and as they passed on the couch on which he reclined at table, examined them very closely, like those who traffic in slaves, and if anyone from modesty held down her face, he raised it up with his hand. Afterwards, as often as he was in the humour, he would quit the room, send for her he liked best, and in a short time return with marks of recent disorder about them. He would then commend or disparage her in the presence of the company, recounting the charms or defects of her person and behaviour in private. All while the poor husbands had to sit and smile graciously at his carryings on. As did the father of a young man whom Caligula invited to dine after he had executed his son for some trivial reason, knowing that if he had not been jolly, his other children would have met the same fate. Dinner with Caligula was even more dangerous than dinner with Tiberius. Sometimes he would startle his guests by laughing uproariously. When they asked why he was laughing, he would reply that it was because he could have them executed at any moment. And to emphasise his point, he would often have a prisoner dispatched in front of them. But he didn't have everyone executed. 
One poor soldier, who made a noise when Caligula's favourite actor was on stage, was sent with an apparently important letter to the vassal king of Roman Mauritania, modern-day Morocco. After weeks of travelling, he delivered the letter, which read, Do nothing at all, either good or bad, to the bearer. Another of his famous pranks was the organising of a gladiatorial show with huge expectation that it would be a great spectacle. But what he actually arranged was a show of the most elderly retired gladiators, fighting it out with the lamest and slowest animals to everyone's disappointment. On another occasion at the amphitheatre, he had the canopy drawn back on a hot day, exposing the crowd to the full glare of the sun and having the Praetorian Guard encourage people to stay in their seats. On yet another, he is said to have ordered his guards to throw an entire section of the audience into the arena during the intermission to be devoured by the beasts because there were no prisoners that day, and he was bored. If his silly pranks, degrading humiliations and trivial executions suggest that he had little care for others, the death of his favourite sister Drusilla in June 38 showed that he was capable of feeling emotion. Suetonius suggests that Caligula and all three of his sisters had been lovers for years, but his favourite had always been Drusilla, with whom he was caught in flagrante by their grandmother when they were still teenagers. On becoming emperor, he made her divorce her first husband and marry Marcus Lepidus, with whom it was rumoured he was also on intimate terms. During his illness the previous year, he named Drusilla and Lepidus as his heirs, and when she died he was inconsolable. He ordered a period of public mourning during which it was forbidden for anyone to laugh, use the baths or drink on pain of death. He left Rome and travelled through southern Italy, rushing from town to town, hastily, often at night, barely eating and not shaving or trimming his hair for weeks. On his return, he declared her a goddess, and for the rest of his life, in matters of greatest importance, he would always swear on the divinity of Drusilla. Perhaps emboldened by raising his sister to the status of a god, he decided he would like to join their ranks as well. At first, he likened himself to demigods such as Hercules and Bacchus, and would dress up in elaborate costumes and appear in pantomimes. But later, he ordered that the heads of statues of the gods be replaced by his own likeness. He had the temple of Castor and Pollux made into a kind of vestibule to his palace, and he would stand between the statues of the twin demigods, presenting himself to be worshipped by passers-by. He instituted a temple in honour of his own divinity, with a statue of himself in gold, at which the wealthiest and most sycophantic citizens would offer themselves to be his priests at huge expense. And he quite liked the idea of getting up close and personal with some of the Roman deities. Suetonius tells us, On nights when the moon was full, he was in the constant habit of inviting Luna, the moon goddess, to his embraces and his bed. Whilst most of the Roman historians attributed his beliefs of being divine to being a sign of insanity, Caligula himself is said to have justified his reasoning as follows. As the curators of the herds of other animals, cowherds, goat herds and shepherds, are neither oxen nor goats nor sheep, but men who have received a more excellent portion and a more admirable formation of mind and body. So, in the same manner, is it not fitting that I, who am the leader of the most excellent of all herds, namely the race of mankind, should be considered as being of a superior nature and not merely human, but as one who has received a greater and more holy portion? Despite his obvious grandiosity, he did sometimes show caution. For example, he planned to erect a statue of himself in the Temple of Jerusalem, but he listened to advice that this would be likely to cause rioting and unrest in the province, and abandoned his plans. Throughout his reign, Caligula was very free and easy with the state's finances. When the thrifty Tiberius died, the imperial treasury had around 2.7 billion sesterces in it. In less than a year, it was all gone spent on extravagant games, 
building projects, lavish banquets and gifts for his favourites. To refill the coffers, he began accusing wealthy individuals of corruption, issuing huge fines or having them executed so he could seize their estates. And at one point, he introduced taxes on lawsuits, weddings, even prostitution. Some of his projects were beneficial, such as repairing the walls and temples of Syracuse, building new roads and aqueducts and improving harbours. But others were pure ostentation, such as building a three-mile-long temporary floating bridge across part of the Bay of Naples. Seneca wrote that he commandeered so many boats for the project that grain imports were delayed and the people starved. Ancient sources also describe Caligula building two enormous pleasure barges at Lake Nemi, 20 miles south of Rome. One a floating palace with marble floors, the other a temple to Diana. It was long thought that both of these stories were the unlikely exaggerations of historians wanting to prove his madness. But in 1929, the lake was drained on the orders of Mussolini to reveal two large ships exactly as described by Suetonius, right down to the mosaic floors and even bearing the inscription, Property of Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. Most modern historians suggest that Roman chroniclers such as Suetonius and Dio Cassius writing after Caligula's death were influenced by the political situation of their own times, when it was useful to discredit the actions of earlier emperors with a bit of extra spice thrown in to titillate their readers. And whilst this may be true to an extent, the discovery of the Nemi ships shows that some of the stories they described were accurate. Another of Caligula's acts of apparent craziness, his proposal to make his favourite horse Incitatus a consul, has also been interpreted as an elaborate prank intended to ridicule the Senate by implying that even an animal could carry out their duties. Suetonius wrote that Incitatus had a stable of marble with an ivory manger, purple blankets and a collar of precious stones, as well as a house with fine furniture and a retinue of slaves for the reception of dignitaries invited to sup with him. Cassius Dio tells us that Incitatus had gold flakes mixed with his oats and that Caligula made his horse a priest. And then there are Caligula's bizarre military expeditions. He annexed Mauritania and his armies put down a revolt there but he wasn't personally involved in this campaign. He did, however, travel north to his father's old stomping grounds in Gaul and Germania. Suetonius tells us that he forced his troops to march with almost reckless haste, whilst he himself was carried in a litter by eight bearers, and he insisted on the inhabitants of towns he was passing through, sweeping the roads and sprinkling them with water to reduce the dust. He had Lentulus Gaetulicus, the commander of the armies of the north, for the previous ten years executed, for the reason that he was endeared to the soldiers. And he is then said to have personally led a minor skirmish across the Rhine, and to have recaptured some escaped hostages, but Suetonius suggests these were staged. And then it was time for the invasion of Britain. Julius Caesar had crossed into Britannia briefly ninety years before, and Augustus had thought about it as well. But it was Caligula who marched a huge army to the Channel with plans for a full-scale invasion. He is said to have drawn up his legions on the beach and arranged his ballistas and other artillery and then set off in a trireme. Almost immediately, however, he turned back and from a lofty platform gave the soldiers the signal as if for battle, bidding the trumpeters urge them on. Then, of a sudden, he ordered them to gather up shells in their helmets and gowns. Then, having secured these spoils of war necessary for his triumphal procession, he became greatly elated, as if he had enslaved the very ocean, and he gave his soldiers many presents. This is one of the strangest stories about Caligula, one of the hardest to make sense of. A sudden loss of courage, perhaps? coming to terms with the British king, Cunobelin. Mutinous troops? None sound terribly convincing to me. But the idea that in his madness he declared war on Neptune, the god of the sea, is an entirely modern embellishment made by Robert Graves in I, Claudius. 
Perhaps his most famous departure from acceptable behaviour was his relationship with his sisters. The two contemporary sources do not mention this, but writing later, Suetonius and Cassius Dio go into great detail about what he got up to and how he prostituted his sisters to other men and turned his palace into a bordello. His middle sister Drusilla was always his favourite and remained so until her death, but the other two were later exiled, accused of adultery and conspiring to kill him in the plot of the Three Daggers. There was a powerful taboo against brother-sister relationships in Rome, but sibling marriages were common amongst the pharaohs of Egypt, and he may have been emulating them in trying to maintain a pure bloodline. But another suggestion is that he simply had Drusilla sit in the position usually occupied by a wife at formal dining events, and that there was never any intimacy at all. Whoever else may have graced his bed, he was married four times in total. His first wife died in childbirth. He married his second, Livia Oristilla, after taking a fancy to her at her wedding to another man, although he divorced her quickly and forbade her from ever seeing her first husband. Number three was Lolina Paulina. She was married, but he ordered her to leave her husband and come to Rome after overhearing a remark about the beauty of her grandmother. He divorced her after six months, as she did not get pregnant and forbade her from associating with any other men. Number four was Caesonia. Suetonius says that she was neither beautiful nor young, and already the mother of three daughters when Caligula married her, and describes her as a woman of reckless extravagance and wantonness. She was already pregnant and may even have given birth on their wedding day. In some accounts, he is said to have loved her passionately and faithfully. In others, he is said to have paraded her naked in front of dinner guests and jokingly threatened to have her tortured or killed. Some joke, but like so many facts about the life of Caligula, we simply don't know which ones are true, which are exaggerations, and which ones are downright lies. What we do know, however, is that it all came to a violent end in January 41. After attending a theatrical performance, Caligula was attacked by his own guards in the underground passages beneath his palace. He was 28 and had reigned for less than four years. Like Julius Caesar, he was stabbed 30 times. He didn't stand a chance. There was widespread discontent amongst senators and equestrians and support for such an act, which was carried out the day before Caligula planned to leave Rome for Alexandria in Egypt, from where he intended to rule as a pharaoh, far away from the meddling of the Senate. The conspirators hoped to restore the Republic, and Caligula's wife and daughter were also murdered to ensure the bloodline ceased. But Caligula's cowering uncle Claudius was whisked away by Praetorians, who hailed him as the new emperor, immediately extinguishing any dreams of a return to the Republic. We generally think of Claudius as being one of the better emperors, but Roman historians regarded him as a weak fool, manipulated and controlled by those around him, just another bad member of the Julio-Claudian gang. But what about Caligula's supposed madness? We've already heard some of the modern interpretations of his actions that make them seem more understandable, more logical. But although the ancient sources differ somewhat in their accounts of his life, they all agree that he was unusually cruel, impetuous and lacking in judgment. And I don't think all of their stories can be dismissed as political propaganda. If you do believe that Caligula suffered from a mental disorder, what could it have been? There have been many suggestions as to what may have afflicted him, but there's very little evidence to support any of these from the ancient sources. With the exception of epilepsy, which he is said to have had from a young age. Roman physicians had a good understanding of epilepsy, and we know that several close relatives, including Julius Caesar and his cousin Britannicus, had either epilepsy or unexplained sudden deaths which are known to occur more commonly in epilepsy. Caligula's mysterious illness seven months into his reign 
could have been a prolonged seizure or status epilepticus, which left him with emotional, behavioural and cognitive problems. Sudden mood swings, irritability, bursting into laughter for no reason, poor impulse control, hypersexuality, loss of empathy and an exaggerated startle response all of which can occur in people who have sustained a subtle brain injury. Another suggestion is that his behaviour was due to the Gastaut-Geschwind syndrome, a set of personality changes including hyper-religiosity that occur in people with temporal lobe epilepsy. Yet another suggestion is that he had a psychotic illness associated with his epilepsy. This occurs in around 5% of people with generalised epilepsy, more in those with temporal lobe seizures, and one of its most prominent symptoms is insomnia, something that is repeatedly mentioned in accounts of Caligula's life. Suetonius writes, He was especially tormented with sleeplessness, for he never rested more than three hours at night, and even for that length of time he did not sleep quietly, but was terrified by strange apparitions. Once, for example, dreaming that the spirit of the ocean talked with him. Therefore, weary of lying in bed wide awake during the greater part of the night, he would now sit upon his couch and now wander through the long colonnades, crying out from time to time for daylight and longing for its coming. But I have to say that having read through the contemporary accounts of Philo of Alexandria, Seneca, and the later histories of Tacitus, Suetonius, and Cassius Dio, I did not get a strong impression of psychosis. What came across more were his silly pranks, his sudden changes of mood, his callousness, his recklessness and his disregard for convention. And these, combined with his severe insomnia and history of epilepsy, do suggest that he may have had an organic personality change following his illness in the year 37. Alternatively, he could have been like this all along a sadistic psychopath taking pleasure in the suffering of others. But any modern diagnosis is at best an educated guess, as so many of the details of his life are unclear. One thing I haven't mentioned so far is the psychological impact on his mental health of his upbringing. Experiencing the systematic extermination of his family and witnessing goodness knows what horrors in Tiberius's palace must surely have traumatised the young Caligula, who was previously known for his intelligence and sensitivity. So back to those questions we posed at the beginning. Are all the stories about him true? Some definitely are, some definitely are not, but most are probably in the middle ground of maybes and half-truths. Did he sleep with his sisters? Well, that's a yes if you believe Suetonius but no one really knows for sure. And did he appoint his horse to the Senate? That's probably a no. Suetonius' own phrasing hints at it being gossip. It is even said that he intended to make him consul. So, was Caligula mentally ill? Perhaps? Or was he just being an emperor? We can never know for certain, but thinking about what might have led to his behaviour helps us to be more aware of the dangers of investing too much power in individuals in our own time. Thank you for joining me on this journey into one of history's most fascinating figures. Before I finish, I must thank Dr. Radwa Gabr of Alexandria for her help in researching this video. If the complex world of Roman history is of interest, then please check out my videos on Tiberius and Julius Caesar. And I hope to see you again soon to carry on looking into the past to better understand the present. Goodbye for now.